welcome everyone. I am the vice president and I have the lucky job of booking the speakers for the members meeting. This month was really easy because our speaker is one of our class graduates. Dr. Christopher Keaton Keating was a 2014 class member. And even though he had a PhD in physics, he still found it valuable to be in our master naturalist class. He was, has been teaching physics and astronomy for 30 years, and he's currently doing research on planetary geophysics, including climate change. Um, it's interesting also though, that the, the way that he got interested in this heat is because he's a long distance hiker. And if you are interested in nature in central Texas, you will be exposed to the heat. And uh, he feels that we have really not been alert enough to the danger of getting overheated. And this happens to ranchers and cattle, not just hikers. Um, so he's going to be talking about the impact of heat on public health. And uh, it, it doesn't always make big headlines, but it's something very important. And he has been looking into a method of measuring temperature compared to the heat index. So Chris, are you on? I am, can you hear me? There you are. You can hear me? Yes, I can hear you. All right. Uh, glad to be here. Welcome everyone. Uh, tonight we're going to talk about heat and the wet bulb globe temperature. Uh, heat's known as the, uh, the silent killer and we'll see why here very quickly. Um, very quickly. What is the number one weather related killer in the U.S. over the last 10 years and over the last 30 years? Uh, so, you know, you don't have to ring in, just think for yourself, uh, for the 10 years and the 30 year periods, is it flood, heat, hurricane, lightning, or tornado? Thank you, sir. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for help. Okay, so this is the data from the National Weather Service uh, for the year 2019, 2010, uh, the red bar is 2019, the blue bar is for the 10 year average. 2010 through 2019, and yellow is the 30-year average, 1990 through 2019. And we can see heat was the number one killer in the U.S. on average for both the 30-year and the 10-year. It's very close. It's not uh, just a little bit worse than flood over the 10-year, uh, but the 30-year is clearly way up above everyone else. And, you know, the this is why we call it the silent killer, because 138 people a year are dying from heat over the last 30 years, but those aren't the headlines. The headlines, here are the headlines down here, five people a year, 45 people a year in hurricanes or tornadoes. That's because they all happen at once. Now the details on that, uh, well, it varies from place to place. So these you know, color-coded areas uh, indicate the number one weather-related killer in these various areas. You can see eastern part of Texas is where heat is the number one weather-related killer. Where we live, it's flash floods. Uh, and you know, keep this in mind when we talk about it because the big factor with heat isn't the temperature, it's the humidity. And, you know, East Texas is more humid than West Texas. All right, so what are we talking about when we talk about heat-related illnesses? There's actually four that are uh, more commonly talked about. Uh, there's others, but these are the four main ones. Uh, heat cramps are the mildest, and this is, occurs when you've been out in the sun and you're losing uh, essential nutrients and uh, along with uh, excessive amounts of water and salt. Uh, the one that you may not be familiar with is uh, uh, heat syncope, uh, and this is a moderate illness. This happens when you lose too much fluid, you've overexerted yourself, and you begin to feel weak and fatigued, 
and maybe even start getting dizzy and fainting. Uh, next up would be heat exhaustion. By now we're starting to get into some pretty serious stuff. Uh, this is when you've basically dehydrated yourself and you're starting to injure yourself. Next up is heat stroke, and this is very severe. This is a medical emergency. Uh, this occurs when you've been in long, intense periods of exposure to heat and your body loses the ability to cool itself. Uh, so now you are, you're pulling in lots of heat. The human body is a tremendous heat generator. And so you're generating all this heat, but you're not able to go and dissipate that heat. Uh, this is very, very serious. Uh, and if someone you know, if you or someone you know is suffering from a heat stroke or sunstroke, it's very important to get treatment very soon. Uh, so uh, everyone should be familiar with the differences between heat exhaustion uh, or heat stroke. Uh, one of the things to emphasize on this is uh, we suffer from this uh, psychology in the United States and maybe worldwide of everything's binary. Uh, it's left, right, up, down, Coke versus Pepsi. Well, that's not the way things really are. It's, it is a spectrum. And so you can say, well, you have heat stroke and you die or you don't die. And that's not the way it is at all. Uh, first off, you know, there's different ways to die. And it's not like someone snapped the finger and you drop dead in your tracks and there's no pain and no suffering. Uh, you can go through a very long period before you die. Also, even if you recover, many heat stroke victims suffer permanent injury or long-term injury. Uh, one of the recurring things is once you've suffered from heat stroke, many times you will suffer from it more easily in the future. So it's, it is a very serious illness and something to watch out for. Uh, and it, it isn't just people who are uh, old and laborers out in the sun. We find heat effects everywhere. Of course, we know uh, in Texas, I'm sure we've all heard of the instances where people have been locked into cars or something like that and, uh, and suffer the consequences. Uh, but here we see, this is from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Heat illness during practice or competition is a leading cause of death and disability among US high school athletes. So these are young people in very good physical condition. And it illustrates the fact that this can happen to anyone. Uh, interesting studies have shown that the risk of developing a heat-related illness is 11.4 times higher in football than all other sports combined. And if we take a look at this picture, we can see why. Uh, here we are, here's, it looks like it's probably a peewee league, but here we have them in dressed in dark clothing. Uh, we want them to be safe, so they're wearing pads, which uh, retain the heat. And of course, we want them to wear helmets. And so the part of your body that radiates heat the most efficiently is your head. <laughs> and so what have we done? We've gone and put a thermal uh, insulator on our heads and stuck them out in the heat where pads are gonna hold it in and uh, our dark clothing is gonna absorb it. So uh, it's very important that we pay attention to these kinds of things with uh, our athletes. And it isn't always athletes. I put this one in there. This one caught my attention when I saw it. Uh, this is a Tennessee band member during a halftime performance at a football uh, game and collapsed. Uh, I was in my high school marching band and we were in subtropical climate. And I'm telling you, by the time we were able to get those uniforms off, uh, we were suffering. So it's, it's a real thing. Heat wave deaths from 1986 to 2019, heat waves have killed more people in the United States than any other weather related disaster. 40, almost 4,300 deaths as a result of heat during this period. Uh, and this averages out to 129 fatalities per year. Okay, that's right around in the, uh, the area of that first graph we saw, 130 people per year from heat. But from 1999 to 2010, there were 
8,000, almost 8,100 heat-related deaths reported in the United States. Uh, this comes out to 735 deaths per year. That is much higher than the figure that we were getting before. So you might say, what's the difference here? There's the key word right there, heat-related uh, versus heat wave. Part of the problem is there is no commonly accepted definition of what a heat wave is. Uh, one of the things that they're working on, on internationally is uh, to start naming the heat waves the way we name tropical storms and winter storms. The big issue is no one can agree on what the definition of a heat wave is. And so there's a difference between heat wave and heat related and, uh, and all of that isn't consistent. Uh, this, is, this part, that same report is very interesting for this last line. Uh, the three states with the highest burden, Arizona, Texas, and California, accounted for 43% of all of the heat-related deaths. Uh, this other part, not too surprising, most of them occur May, September. We would expect that. Here's the, the list of uh, annual deaths, according to the CDC. Now, part of this is, let's suppose we find that some, some old guy who is overweight, uh, is a known alcoholic, uh, has signs of heart disease, maybe diabetes, and he's laying dead in the field and it's 105 outside. What killed him? <clears throat> and you say, okay, well, heat may have contributed to it, but he died from heart failure. <laughs> and so the death certificate says heart failure, not heat. I saw once that before the mid 1970s, if you go in back and check the death certificates, no one died from diabetes in the United States before the mid 1970s. That's because it was not listed as the cause of death, even though it was the underlying condition they would go and put organ failure or something like that. So it wasn't until the mid 1970s that they started specifically listing on death certificates that someone died from diabetes. And then we started getting uh, a clearer picture of the extent of, the, of that disease. Same thing with heat. And so did he die from heat or was heat just something that was happening at the same time? So we come up with these inconsistent numbers. The number of deaths due to heat depends on who you ask, and there's no clear directive on reporting heat as the cause of death. We've already seen indications that the true number may be vastly underreported. And if that is the case, then what we're facing is a much more serious uh, danger than we thought. Here is a paper uh, June 2020, so it came out just last summer. Uh, some people went, a team of uh, researchers went and examined the death certificates in 297 counties of the United States. Uh, these 297 counties represented almost 62% of the United States population in 2000. And they estimated there's 5,600 deaths per year. That is seven times as high as what we just saw and almost 40 times as high as what we saw in the first graph. Uh, their conclusion was, our results suggest that the number of deaths related to heat in the United States is substantially larger than previously reported. Uh, one, of the neat, uh, one of the interesting notes that they had in their uh, paper was that, uh, one out of every 227 deaths is estimated to be heat related. Also, they said many of these deaths occurred only moderately hot temperatures. Now, what about in Texas? So this is from the Texas Department of State Health Services. And they reported in the six year period, 2003 through 2008, there were 263 deaths among Texas residents with exposure to excessive natural heat. And they were very specific as an underlying cause of death. This comes out to be about 44 deaths per year. Now, 
when we look at the plot, the blue bars are cold related deaths, red bars are heat related deaths. There's nothing here that's really surprising. Cold deaths are in the winter, hot deaths are in the summer. But if we look more closely, it starts getting very interesting. We can see here in February, we still have heat deaths. In March, April, they start going up, and then we get into the summer months, and we still have heat deaths in October, November, and all the way into December. In fact, the only month in this period where there are no heat-related deaths was January. We had heat-related deaths in 11 out of 12 months. Uh, conversely, if you go and look at the cold-related deaths, obviously in the winter time, but we still have cold-related deaths in April, May, June, July, and all the way into August. Uh, hypothermia is another greatly under, uh, underestimated danger. And you can see even in August, uh, someone died from uh, hypothermia. Uh, in fact, I would suggest that that may be a good uh, AT uh, lecture in the future. Very strange stuff, hypothermia. So this indicates the danger from the heat is much greater than what we expected. And it's not just the summertime. Although the major vast majority occur in the summertime, it isn't limited to the summer. All right, so this brings up the question, where are we heading heat-wise in the short term? And by short term, I mean the spring and into the summer. All right, so this has a lot to do with what is known as the El Nino Southern Oscillation, ENSO for short. Uh, this is a, a pattern where the, uh, it's defined as the Pacific waters along the equator get hotter or colder. And uh, this will go and cause a change in the weather patterns worldwide. Uh, so just to define what we're talking about, here's North America over here, South America. This is the equator going right through the middle. Uh, you can see this is Australia down here, Philippines. So we're going right on across the entire Pacific. And they go and define certain areas. And they go and they measure the water temperature, surface temperature, and all the way down to 200 meters in this area. And they keep track of that. When we have an El Nino, here we are, the same thing. Here's Australia, here's North America and South America. And you can see what we get is hot water east, or I'm sorry, west of uh, South America. This is along the equator right here. And this results in a couple of convection patterns. We have trade winds coming in from the west, from out towards Indonesia, and they hit that hot water and they keep it from going farther west. And this results in two big convection cells. Uh, El Nino is happens when the water gets at least uh, half a degree Celsius for an average of three months. And uh, then we also have to get these convection patterns appearing. So the atmosphere has to link with the ocean surface for us to have an El Nino. This is the last big El Nino we had in uh, January 2016. Here's the equator going across the middle, North America up here, South America. And this is what is known as a sea surface temperature anomaly. This isn't the actual temperatures. This reflects how much warmer it is compared to the long-term average. In this case, our long-term average was 1981 through 2010. And so we can see in those uh, El Nino areas that we were looking at in the previous one, the water is much warmer than normal than the long-term average. And then out here, again, we see, uh, just like in that graphic, uh, cooler waters out here. So the cooler waters are sending trade winds this way, and then it circulates up, and that keeps this from moving farther west, and so we get a weather pattern going that way. Uh, for us here in the United States, North America, and Texas, uh, this is the kind of weather pattern that results. The trade wind is pushed down south. And here in Texas, we end up with wet and cool conditions, typically. Uh, the polar jet stream coming down 
this uh, low pressure areas go counterclockwise. And so the wind rotates around uh, and comes up from the south. And you can see it pushes up on this, keeps this area warm and dry, and keeps that polar jet stream farther to the north. And so the mid country doesn't get as much severe weather in the wintertime. La Nina is the opposite. The water cools uh, by minus 0.5 degrees Celsius, at least. It can get much more strong, uh, much stronger than that. But uh, once again, North America, South America, we see this cool wind goes all the way across the Pacific, uh, bunches up the hot water north of Australia, and we get one big convection pattern in the atmosphere all the way around the Pacific Ocean. Uh, we are currently in a La Nina uh, as of last fall. It is getting weaker though. So you can see this is what the sea surface temperature anomalies were in 30 September versus 6 January. And if you compare along the equator, don't worry about the stuff off the equator. We're only interested in those El Nino boxes. We can see that the water has warmed up quite a bit since then. Uh, so. Uh, we're, it looks like we're reaching the end of this La Nina. These are actual uh, sea surface temperatures. This is an anomaly, this is the actual temperatures. And so starting in October, going through middle of January, and you see there's that big glob of hot water north of Australia. And here in the Pacific, it was colder and it's uh, getting warmer. Ignore that, that's out of our El Nino box. But here in our El Nino box, the cold water we can see is getting warmer towards January. All right, so what does that mean for us? We now, instead of having that low pressure system, we have a high pressure system here in the North Pacific. And the Pacific jet stream goes much farther north. And we have this polar jet coming down more towards the center of the, the, the continent. Here in Texas, we get uh, dry and warm. And that's definitely what we have had uh, since last, uh, uh, the end of last summer. Our conditions have been very dry and we've been above average in temperature. Uh, here's another graphic showing the same thing. Here's that polar jet. And if you've been paying attention to the national weather, you see this is, we've been seeing this pattern a lot. Uh, the colder air is coming down and we have these, uh, Winter storms have been plunging down, hitting in the southeast, and then curving up into the North in, uh, New England area. Meanwhile, we've, we've been sitting down here dry, uh, envious of how much rain they've been getting. Now, if you're gonna get El Nino at plus 0.5 degrees and La Nina at minus 0.5 degrees, that means there has to be something in between, and we call this neutral. Uh, neutral is kind of, it looks similar to a, uh, a weak La Nina. We have the cooler waters here. They're not as cool and it's not as extensive. We have the warmer waters here, not as hot, not as extensive, but we still have a big convection pattern. And when we look at this, this is the kind of conditions we get. So the polar jet stream comes way down and then goes uh, back towards the Northeast but we get an extra one right here. And this comes in and gives us here in Texas warm and wet weather. So uh, this is uh, what we see a lot. Now this is a table of the ENSO conditions. So let me point out what we're looking at. This is just a part of the table. Table goes all the way back to 1950. Uh, I just chopped off a piece to make the point. So here are the years, uh, 2020 is the last complete year. And the numbers are uh, what was the uh, sea surface temperature in that three month period. And these three month periods are abbreviated by the initials of the month. So this is December, January, February, January, February, March, February, March, April, right on across. Blue ones are La Nina's, Red ones are El Nino's, gray ones are neutral. And if you look very quickly, you can see most of the time, in fact, 
uh, we are in a neutral condition. That is the prevailing condition is neutral. Uh, and we, it is called an oscillation, but you can see it is a, a true oscillation in the term that we would use it as in physics. Um, touched it and made it come back down. Uh, because, here we go. What we see is that here we have an El Nino, and then we had an El Nino. We didn't go into a La Nina in between these two El Ninos. Oscillation, that's exactly what we would do. So uh, as a physicist, I had some reservations using the term oscillation there. There we go. All right, what does this mean for us? Uh, the latest discussion on the current conditions uh, from just last week, uh, La Nina is expected to continue through the Northern Hemisphere winter with a 95% chance during the January, February, March timeframe. Uh, and there is a potential transition to ENSO neutral, 55% chance by April to June. All right, so we were in a moderate uh, La Nina, which gave us that warm, dry condition for the, the fall going into the winter. And now we're starting to transition into an ENSO neutral. This is uh, a plot of the models. You can see there's lots of different models. Lots of people work on this. The dark blue line is the consensus. And here's our minus 0.5 line, minus 0.5 degrees centigrade. And you can see that according to the models, we will be transferring from La Nina to neutral somewhere in the February, March, April timeframe. So that you can see we are approaching uh, that neutral condition. And actually by now we are, uh, uh, we're getting in this area here, we're ne getting near the end of January. And so we're in this area here and we're approaching neutral. Now this is a storm that happened last week. Uh, the big rainstorm we had system that came through. Uh, these are the, uh, this is the jet stream. And uh, very quickly, you can, it might be hard for you to make out. Here's North America, here's South America, there's Texas right there. If we look, we have our jet stream here, we have a jet stream here, and we have a jet stream coming down from the polar areas. Now compare that to our graphic. This is what we said was our winter, neutral winter pattern. And you can see it is very, very similar to what we see going on here. And so we have our one, two, three jets, one, two, three jets. And uh, it's been uh, pretty warm and of course it was wet. So it looks as though the system is starting to convert over to a uh, ENSO neutral. Now these are the forecasts for far February, March, April, FMA. Now, before you get alarmed, the color coding is probability, not temperature. So being a big red bar area here doesn't mean that they're projecting lots of heat. What they're projecting is a 60% chance that the temperature will be above average. Uh, likewise over here, the brown doesn't mean it's gonna be way, way uh, dry. They're saying there's a 40% chance that it will be drier than neutral. Now, the way I look at it, 60% chance of warmer than neutral, that's pretty good. We could probably expect it to be warmer. 40% chance of drier than neutral, well, that means there's a 60% chance that it will either be uh, uh, even or wetter. And so my feeling is, is that this will probably uh, go away as the spring goes away and they do more computer models. This is for June, July, and August, uh, JJA. And again, we can see pretty high probability, 60% probability chance that we're gonna have a summer warmer than average, long-term average. But they're indicating that we're gonna have normal rainfall. During the, the, uh, the fall, this is our total precipitation from September 1st to November 30th. And you can see, we 
here in Central Texas, uh, nor these people out here, they are suffering. Uh, we had less than average. Uh, so we were pretty dry. And any of you who've been keeping track of it know that that was the case. Uh, here's the drought monitor for January 19th. Uh, so this came out just last Thursday. And you can see in our area, uh, we were in drought conditions, although this is, I'll show you here in a minute, this is greatly improved. I'm showing you the whole country because remember our weather comes in from the West. And so when we look out here where our weather is gonna be coming in from, they are still suffering. They're in uh, extreme drought, even exceptional drought. In fact, uh, this is becoming so prevalent over the last decade or so, they're talking about adding a new level of drought uh, beyond D4 exceptional drought. And here we are in Texas. This is the same one. Uh, here's uh, Kerr County, and you can see we are in uh, a severe drought, although it is definitely improving. Uh, the one on the right was the same thing, same source from December, uh, December 22nd. And here we are just a month later, January 19th, and you can see how much we've improved. And so we have been getting some nice rain. We got a couple, uh, I don't know about you guys down in Kerrville, up here in Mason, we got a couple of really good snowstorms, which was great because the snow melted slowly. And so the water was able to soak into the ground. Uh, other indicators, when we look at the, the Llano River, this is from the Llano River Watershed Alliance, uh, just from uh, last week. They looked at the flow of the Llano River. And what they find is that uh, how much flow we have during the winter at junction is a good predictor for what the summer flow will be at the, the city of Llano. If the average monthly flow from August through February is below 85 cubic feet per second, the summer flow at Llano will drop below 21 cubic feet per second, which is very severe. Uh, and right now, they say it's at right at 85 cubic feet per second. What is important is this number has been going up with the uh, weekly report. So it's been getting higher every week. So again, the indicator is that uh, our water situation will be better. So this is, the, uh, this is from uh, what's called PRISM. This shows the total precipitation for the month of December. And you can see we still didn't get a lot. These wide areas are areas that didn't get any rain at all for the entire month of December. And here's those big storm systems that went, uh, went north. That's, that's nice, but what we really wanna know is um, what about the anomaly? How does this compare to the long-term average? And we can see our long-term average, uh, we were below during the month of December. Temperature-wise, we were pretty cool. Uh, it was nice, it wasn't real cold in December. In fact, when we look at the temperature anomaly, we can see that we were above average in December. Well, how does that compare to now? All right, so here's our rainfall for the month of January so far. I got rid of this thing before. All right, uh, and here's our temperature now. But when we look at the anomaly, we can see rainfall, we were close to average, maybe a little bit below. So we, so far in January, we have improved. Uh, before in December, we were below average. Now we're right about at average. Temperature wise, we're actually a little below average for January so far. Uh, this is the long-term average for the rainfall in Kerrville. I, I apologize for this. I have no idea how to get rid of that thing. There we go. Uh, and the good news is we just we are just now finishing the driest month of the year. Actually, 
it's the driest month, uh, the least amount of, of rainfall. The driest month would be August. Although August gets a little bit more rainfall, the temperature makes it uh, technically drier. But we're starting to get into our spring rain here and our wettest months in Kerrville are in May and June. Uh, so we are starting to transition from that dry period, a dry weather pattern of La Nina into a neutral, just in time for us to get our big rain supply. So that will help our water supply. Um, just when I thought I got rid of it. This shows the groundwater in the continental United States as of December 7th. And you can see at that time, we were way below. And here is the predicted soil moisture for the area. And again, uh, way below. And you say, well, why do we care? This is about heat. Why are we talking about drought? Water moisture acts for temperature the same way that sweat does. Uh, as it evaporates, it cools the ground. And so it keeps the heat from building up. So if we have good soil moisture, then the temperature won't get as high. The converse of that is if we get too much evaporation, then the humidity goes up. Uh, so here's our seasonal drought outlook. It's actually improving. Uh, this is gonna be normal and maybe improving a little bit. So sort of spring, summer, models and indicators show an about an even chance we will return to inso neutral with conditions that are warmer and wetter than normal. Now, it's important to understand that when they say it's wetter, that doesn't mean flooding. And when they say warmer, that doesn't mean that it's gonna be blazing hot, but it could. All right, second question, where are we heading in the long term in the future years? All right, so when we look at the United States compared with 1970, we see the United States has gone up, Texas has gone up even more, and San Antonio has gone up even more. So since 1970, the average temperature in San Antonio uh, has gone up three degrees. And these are degrees Fahrenheit now. Uh, looking at the seasons, and we're gonna be talking about meteorological seasons. So fall begins uh, September 1st, September, October, November. Winter begins December 1st. Spring begins uh, March 1st and summer begins June 1st. Uh, so we see the daytime temperature in the fall has gone up 2.6 degrees since 1970. And what is alarming is the nights have been getting warmer. Uh, cool nights are very important. That's when you shed off that extra heat and you recover. If you can't get off, get rid of that heat during the night, then you're gonna start out already overheated uh, in, the, in the morning. And plus the environment's going to be warmer too. So we see we have this trend of warming days and warming nights. Winter, same story. We're getting less cold, less often in the winter. So our winters are getting warmer. Springtime, getting warmer. We're getting more warm spring days. These are the days above normal. We have 14 more days above normal per year now than we did in 1970. Summer, no surprise, 3.3 degrees warmer on average. Summer nights, getting warmer. First 95 degree or warmer day is, is occurring 21 days earlier now than it was in 1970. And we're getting longer streaks of 95 degrees or more. When we look at the number of days above normal divided by decades, we see in the 2000s, we got a little bit of a break, but every decade other than the 2000s has had a greater number of days above normal. Now, what does this mean? It doesn't mean that we're not gonna have cold days anymore. And it doesn't mean that every day is going to be hot, but it means that the probability of cold days is reduced. We're gonna have fewer cold days and we're gonna have more hot days. Of course, we still have all of this area in the middle that is our more moderate. All right. 
here in Texas. And uh, this is an older paper. Uh, this is from 1983, but it's still pertinent. And the highlight is mine. I put this in. The data suggests that persistent high temperatures related to death to a greater degree than the temperature peaks reached. In other words, <clears throat> a moderate, a long moderate heat is more deadly than a short hot heat. So Texas is hot. We know that. We show, we see the data indicating it is getting hotter. I think anyone who grew up in Texas knows that that's true. Uh, I've, I hear people tell stories all the time uh, when they were children. I grew up in Texas, so I have my own. It was colder when we were children. Uh, heat is dangerous to our health, we know that. But what we are finding out is that heat is a much greater danger than we suspected. So we need to take steps to safeguard ourselves while working outdoors. The two that we use they are the heat index and the wet bulb globe temperature, which you may not have heard of, but has been around for a while. Heat index is what the temperature feels like to the human body when you include the relative humidity. Remember what I talked about, the heat's going up, but if we get evaporation from a lot of water, then the humidity may go up too. It's also known as the apparent temperature. So as the air temperature and relative humidity increase or decrease, the heat index will increase or decrease. Uh, it is taken in the shade, and that is one of the issues with it. Because once you get out in the sunlight, your heat index temperature can go up as much as 15 degrees. And it does not factor in wind chilling effects. So here's the heat index table. And for instance, we just take our 90 degree temperature, and this is the air temperature. So 90 degrees, as we increase the humidity going down, Staying at 90 degrees, we go into extreme caution to danger level and all the way down into extreme danger uh, just by increasing the humidity. We didn't increase the temperature any, we just increased the humidity. So it, it is a factor. Uh, you hear the, story, the, the old saying, it's not the heat, it's the humidity. Well, that's a combination of the both, but definitely humidity makes a difference. All right. Wet bulb global temperature is similar to the heat index, but it was developed in the 1950s by the military because what happened in, the, in World War II and training after World War II, we found out the troops were suffering uh, heat injuries and even dying, training in the heat, and the heat index said that it was okay. Uh, they developed this, and when they implemented it into training, heat injuries and deaths were drastic, drastically reduced. And it takes more into account than just the humidity. Uh, temperature and humidity, yes, but it also includes wind speed, the sun angle, the amount of cloud cover, and it also includes the physical activity. And so here we have a comparison of the two. Uh, here's the heat index, and here is the WBGT. And you see the difference uh, between the two of them. So for any outside activities, work or sports, uh, the WBGT is better than the heat index. In fact, a lot of places uh, require you to use the WBGT. A lot of uh, school systems, the military uses it, uh, athletic uh, organizations. So if you're going to be active, if you're going to be in the direct sunlight, you want to use the WBGT. And so, you, and these are, uh, WBGT degrees that we're talking about here. So we're not talking about air temperature 90, 88, 89, we're talking about WBGT temperatures. Uh, and so you can see uh, that it doesn't take much when you're active in the direct sunlight before you have reached uh, very dangerous levels. Uh, here's a table. And it's surprising when you go and you look at it, it doesn't take long before you start getting stressed out. Even at low conditions, 45 minutes, uh, and you're stressed out. 30 minutes, 20 minutes, 15 minutes is all it takes. And this is uh, at, at low levels of, of uh, activity. What should you do? Lots of breaks, 
lots of hydration. Here we have one that's divided between the moderate work and the hard work. And down here, or greater than 89, this one says, don't do it. Stay out, don't do any physical activity out there. Here's a comparison with the heat index. Now the equation, you could use the dew point or you can use the air temperature either way. So that's why this table includes both. But if you look, we have three temperatures that are the same, three humidities that are the same. What is different is the uh, sky cover, the wind, and then we see heat index stays the same, but the WBG, uh, WBGT changes. And they repeat this three different times. So we can see the heat index stays the same, but our wet bulb changes. And so uh, this takes into account the things like the direct sunlight and the wind. So if you're active out there in the sunlight, that's what you want to do. You, okay, so at this point, you're probably going, wow, this sounds great. How do I get this? First thought would be the National Weather Service. Unfortunately, you can read it. Wet bulb globe temperature, prototype under development, not to be used for operational use. And in fact, this one doesn't have anything at all. However, they really are working on it. This is one for Raleigh, North Carolina. And it is an active one. But again, they say this is a prototype, not official, availability not guaranteed. And, but you can see once they get it going, uh, they'll have the forecast for different periods. And so uh, they are working on it. Hopefully uh, someday in the future, you'll be able to log into the National Weather Service and see what your WBGT will be in your area. Until then, you need a sensor. And so the one on the left is a handheld sensor. Uh, the one on the right is a mounted one. Uh, it can go and communicate with your computer or other devices. Uh, the handheld one, they can run from like $125 to $500. The mounted one obviously can get up into thousands of dollars. Here's an example of uh, someone, of a, a, a coach going out and measuring uh, out on the tennis courts. The state of Florida by law requires all of the school districts to use the WBGT. Uh, I believe Georgia does too. So what do you do? You wanna go and check on this before you go out. We see it is a serious problem, bigger problem than what we thought, and it's getting worse. So make sure you're prepared and take safety measures before you go out. And if you're gonna be out there working, uh, make sure you take breaks, breaks in the shade, breaks in the air conditioning if you can, and hydrate. All right, so you see it's a problem for humans. It stands to reason it's also gonna be a problem for uh, agriculture purposes. In fact, heat is very harmful to livestock. Uh, pets aren't really agricultural, but I included them here. We have our, our pet friends. We want to protect them. Uh, he causes disease, uh, increase in the number of disease days. It's harmful to bees. All of you out there that have crops growing or uh, your uh, gardens, uh, you want to nurture those bees. Uh, wine grapes is a big uh, industry in this area now, and it's detrimental to wine grapes hurts beer production, which is becoming more of a industry in this area. And of course, it leads to wildfires as well. And when I drive around out here, uh, I, I'm astonished at how much fuel we have in this area. If you followed the wildfires in Western Oregon last fall, their, uh, their countryside was almost identical to what we have here in the hill country. And I was looking at some of the towns that burn and they are comparable to the size of uh, Fredericksburg in Kerrville, burned to the ground. The entire town was burned to the ground, 6,000, 10,000 people. Understand and prevent heat stress in your dairy cattle. This is an interesting paper. I went looking, it's okay, how bad is it a problem for livestock? <clears throat> and there's almost no research done. What, what the research I find is disturbing. Uh, this one says, 
$900 million in dairy industry losses per year. Uh, and if you keep going through these, we're running out of time, so I'm going to rush it. What you see is they keep talking about the heat index right here, temperature and relative humidity. And so they're using the heat index, effects of heat waves on dairy cow mortality. Uh, this one, uh, the interesting line here, effect of heat waves on human mortality has been studied in depth. Conversely, this topic has been poorly investigated in livestock species. So we really don't know a lot what happens. Uh, for those of you that have livestock, I recommend you read this, this article. This is a very interesting article. There's way too much in it to go and summarize in this lecture. Uh, once again, uh, a temperature humidity index alone may not predict cattle heat stress. And so uh, it, it emphasizes that we need to do more than just look at the heat and humidity. How many cattle die from heat? Can't find it. There's no records of that unless something big. For instance, July 2011, newspapers reported thousands of cattle were lost to heat and drought, as many as 4,000 cattle in Iowa alone. Then in July 2017, thousands of cattle die in California heat wave. Here's one, a paper from uh, 2019. Uh, Estimated heat stress had an annual economic burden of between $1.7 and $2.4 billion on the U.S. animal agriculture industries. Uh, beef industry lost $370 million per year. So here's some of the effects that can have on your livestock. Sure, it can kill them, but it can re reduce the feed intake, weight gain, poor breeding, I mean, uh, just think about it. You're hot and sweaty and cranky. Uh, how romantic do you get? Lower milk production, increased disease susceptibility, changes in behavior. This is from the uh, Iowa State. So, you know, there's options. Provide shade, ventilation, cool water, wet them down, give them sprinklers. And again, here is our... Uh, our categories, the effects that can have on you, and the precautionary things that you need to take. So Texas has extreme temperature. We all know that. But what we see, the data is indicating it's getting worse, both for us and for the agriculture. Coming months this year will probably be warmer than normal, also probably uh, wetter than they have been the last several months. Coming years will tend to be increasingly warmer. Heat index is good if you're gonna be spending your time in the shade or inactive. But if you're gonna be out in the direct sunlight, you need to take greater care. Uh, and so the wet bulb global temperature has a proven track record, 70 years of use. And so uh, that is a good alternative to turn to if you're gonna be active in the sunlight. And here's some reference for, references for you. So if you have any questions, we have a few minutes left. If, if anyone uh, has a question, could you put it in the chat? And uh, Chris, I wondered, are the wet bulb sensors being used locally with sports teams? That's a very good question, and I don't know the answer to that. Hmm. There is no state requirement for it. Anybody else? This is Elsa. Yeah, I would like to know if um, the fact that the, the rapid rise in the heat uh, index of uh, San Antonio, does that have, is the, the rapid growth and the uh, less permeable surfaces that are springing up everywhere, does that have anything to do with that increase? It absolutely does. It absolutely does. That's called the heat island effect. Uh, that data there has been adjusted for the heat island effect. And so uh, that is, uh, is all 
predicated on the idea that uh, we want to see what the environment is doing, not just what the city is doing. But absolutely, you get the heat island effect. Cities are hotter than countrysides. And so uh, we take that into account in those, those calculations. Chris, Bridget was asking if you use a wet bulb device when you go hiking, but I'd also, you could tell us what precautions you would take if you were going to go hiking in Texas in the summer. Uh, well, I'm not big on hiking in Texas in the summer. So my, my number one precaution is uh, don't do it. <laughs> so uh, uh, where I go hiking in the summer, it's gonna be a lot cooler. Uh, and my number one precaution is uh, I hydrate like crazy. Uh, I'm, when I'm out on the trail in the summertime, uh, I'm drinking about three gallons of water per day. Yeah. I'd like we had another question asking where you could buy those devices. I think you'd probably get them on Amazon, couldn't you? You can get them on Amazon. You can also get them directly from the manufacturers if you do uh, some searches. Uh, they're very easy to get. They're, it's not hard to find them at all. Hmm. Well, this would be a culture change because when my son was in uh, Pop Warner football, they practiced at 100 degree temperature. So... At and some I'm, point, people would have to realize that this is not a good idea. And no and water I'm, with salt tablets. <laughs> yeah. Uh, if you've ever seen that movie or, or heard the stories about when Texas A&M did their bit out at uh, Junction uh, back in the 50s, uh, if you drink water, you're considered weak. Uh, so, you know, uh, there's all sorts of stories. So, you know, I'm not... Uh, I, I'm a pro football guy. I love football. So I'm, you know, don't get me wrong, but just like anything, we want to be safe about it, especially with our children. There was one more question on the chat about what site was the La Nina and El Nino, El Nino found? Uh, I think I have the references in the, the, the slides. So once you post them, uh, you can get on there. Uh, what specifically, because there is a lot of slides about the ENSO, which one in particular were you looking for? It, it didn't specify. It was just asking about what site you got the information for the La Nina and El Nino. Uh, that, I, in fact, it was right on one of those slides uh, where the discussion, if you go to, let's see, I could probably pull it up real quick. There is a ENSO webpage with NOAA. You know, if you do a search on NOAA ENSO, uh, it, you should get it probably the first hit. And they, they produce a monthly diagnostic discussion. And in that discussion, they have all the, the data. Chris has given us the, uh, the presentation so that we can put it on the website. So you'll have so, access to it later. Someone asked, uh, is there a difference, uh, heat stroke, death, et cetera, by gender? Um, the only thing I've seen on that is that the typical profile is, uh, is a male because, I mean, let's face it, who's dominant, you know, the old saying, you know, the, uh, mad dogs and Englishmen, only mad dogs. And Englishmen go out in the noonday sun. Well, yeah, they need to adjust that. You know, dumb men. Uh, so that's the reason you see more men dying from it is because men are the ones out there working in the heat in the direct sunlight. Anything else from anyone? Someone was asking about that Inso website. I'm seeing if I can pull it up. Yeah. Yeah. I, my browser doesn't want to cooperate with Zoom going at the same time, I guess. Well, I think it's because you're sharing your screen. So if you were to temporarily just say, just share your screen. Here we go. Then you could, you could find it and then share it again. Yeah. 
it's a NOAA ENSO, uh, N-O-A-A space E-N-S-O. And uh, like I said, it should probably come up maybe even the first hit. And once you get in there, that there's links to as much data as you would like to find. All of this data is uh, available to anyone with a uh, computer hookup. And you know, technically it's available to anyone in the world. Uh, it's supposed to be, you know, it's made by uh, NOAA or collected by NOAA. Uh, Climatic Data Center, the National Climatic Data Center. And you can go in there and you can find more information than you can believe. Uh, so, you know, all you need is a computer hookup. It's free. Here we go. Here's the, uh, can you see that? National Weather Service Climate Prediction Center. Is that showing up? No, because I think you may be sharing your, your app the PowerPoint presentation versus your screen. So I think if you close your share and then reopen it again on the browser, it should show us. I can't even find the uh, share button anymore. All right, I'm sorry, I'm not uh, proficient enough on this. So. Wait a minute, here we go. Here so this go. screen, there you go. The screen button on the very bottom. Yep. And share this guy. How about now? It's opening. There you go. Got it. Thank you, sir. So there you go. Climate Prediction Center. It's a division of NOAA. And you can see the... Uh, uh, you can see the address up there at the top of the browser. And it even comes in Spanish version too. So. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much, Chris. And it's going to make me think about it in the summertime. When I used to ride bicycles, we'd get up and go at six in the summer so that we wouldn't hit the heat. I used to go out and I, I loved running in the, uh, the hottest part of the day. Oh, yeah. Yes. yeah. I'm surprised you're still with us. I am too. <laughs> well, well, thank you very much. And uh, I look forward to seeing you around. Since All right. Chris lives in Mason and I'm, sounds like he's a pretty busy man, but I'm just another master naturalist hard at work. <laughs> thank you so much. You're welcome. And good night, everybody. Thank you, everybody. And that concludes our chapter meeting for today. We appreciate all your participation. Christopher, so nice to have you with us. My pleasure. Take care. Good night. Good night.